Australia, we learned how Menden founders had gathered their families and belongings from Weymouth and Braintree and traveled westward on dirt roads, passing through the towns of Dedham and Medfield. They then reached crude Indian trails that would eventually lead them to their plantation at Nipmug Great Pond. John Metcalf tells us, we must remember that the pioneer settlers of this place were in the farthest outposts of civilization. They were surrounded by Indians who were daily growing jealous of a race which, since the landing at Plymouth, had taken no step backward. They were in the wilderness and 15 long miles from Medfield. It was the nearest place of succor in case of distress or disaster. We must suppose that most of the time must have been occupied in providing shelter for themselves and their animals, raising their crops upon which they must mainly depend for sustenance and praying to their God. As you've already seen, in their formative years between 1663 and 1667, for Menden founders, it was all about surviving on their wilderness farms, forming their town, and praying to their God. We remember that Goodman Benjamin Albee was allotted property, a seat, as they say in Metcalf's annals, on the Mill River, where it crosses what we now call Hartford Avenue East. In 1664, they had experienced enough of the pain of lugging their corn 15 long, hard miles to Medfield to grind into meal or flour. But it was not until 1672 that the mill was finally constructed and in operation. But why choose that particular site on Mill River? Certainly there were other locations to select, say, on the Blackstone, the West, or the Mumford. But our founders were no fools. The Mill River location was a great choice. We're standing at the Mill River right now, right next to where Albee's Grist Mill used to lie. And we're looking at the river, and we're actually looking at what Mr. Dillon, who owns the property now, Mr. Ed Dillon, who owns the property now, has said that the dam is right there in front of us. You can see sort of the, uh, the rapids area and we're sort of panning back and looking upstream. Mr. Ed Dillon, who owns the Albee land now, suggests that the dam was somewhat higher back then, maybe even two to three feet higher, and that all this area would have been underwater then other than the land that we are standing on. This higher terrain was perfectly suited to house the mill building. The mill race that led to the water wheel would be where he is standing, and the main river heading downstream was on the other side. But like I asked, was there really enough of a water resource upstream to support the water wheel that turned the grindstone? Now we've come up about 200 or 300 yards upstream from where that dam was that we saw. And we're looking into a sort of a bowl where there's, the sides are higher. And you can see the water as I'm panning on this side. And on the other side, there's sort of a high rim. And you can see it goes way back into this area and you could clearly understand that if a dam was high enough and controlled it would have backfilled this whole area and that would have been the resource used for Albee's grist mill. As we look at this this area this could be a, a very very deep pond right? Could you explain right. that for me? Right. If you look at the side, even the other side where the houses are now being built, um, that used to be all an open field when we first moved into our house in 1969. And 
you can see based on how much water is in here now that if you dammed up that um, you know put the dam at the point that we were looking at that and this area started to fill up uh, you can tell just by looking on the other side the water has plenty of room that it can go out and fill up the whole area you could have probably 15 20 feet or more deep you could, you could probably as as long as you made the Britain the uh, dam high enough you could probably go as deep as you wanted so again going back in time it's easily understandable how that resource could have been made right yeah and based on that map the maps that I've seen this was a pretty sizable area, a pretty sizable pond, um, you know, and, 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 and I can understand in seeing this, you know, back here, this is all swamp now, but uh, between the beavers and everything else that's been going on in here, it's starting to fill up again. On a side note, and while we're talking about rivers, it's important to note that Menden although noted for her agrarian hilltop landscape and beauty, within her initial boundaries were later to be vital rivers such as the Blackstone, West, Mumford, and Charles. Do you know how the Mumford got its name? Well, Metcalf tells us that during this early period, a certain Mr. Mumford, a local hunter from Brookfield, coming to Menden, drowned while trying to ford the river. A coroner from Menden, I wonder who that was, was called to view the body and he directed it to be buried. A makeshift coffin was improvised by felling a large chestnut tree, removing the bark hole and binding it strongly about the body with wise. Wise were tough, supple, vine-like twigs, especially made of willow. The body was buried beneath a public house in what is now Uxbridge, the remains being discovered when digging the cellar. Our founders certainly had to make things work from the material that was readily available to them. I'm sorry, folks, but I really like taking side trips, don't you? Since we're talking about funerals, here's a story about colonial Londonderry, New Hampshire that may also be applicable here in Menden. This tidbit was found in Customs and Fashions of Old New England by Alice Morse Earl. It seems the earliest New Englanders had no religious services at a funeral. They typically said no words either of grief, resignation, or faith, but followed the coffin and filled the grave in silence. Letchford has given us a picture of a funeral in New England in the 17th century, which is full of simple dignity, if not of sympathy. I quote, At burials, nothing is read, nor any funeral sermon made, but all the neighborhood or a goodly company of them come together by tolling of the bell and carry the dead solemnly to his grave and then stand by him while he is buried. The ministers are most commonly present. In Londonderry, New Hampshire and neighboring towns that had been settled by scotch Irish planters, the announcement of a death was a signal for cessation of daily work throughout the neighborhood. Kindly assistance was at once given at the house of mourning. Women flocked to do the household work and to prepare the funeral feast. Men brought gifts of food or household necessities and rendered all the advice and help that was needed. A gathering was held the night before the funeral, which in feasting and drinking partook somewhat of the nature of an Irish wake. Much New England rum was consumed at this gathering, and also before the procession to the grave, and also after the internment when the whole party returned to the house for an arbol, and drink began again. The funeral rum bill 
was often an embarrassing and hampering expense to a bereaved family for years. This liberal serving of intoxicating liquor at a funeral was not peculiar to these New Hampshire towns, nor to the Scotch-Irish, but prevailed in every settlement in the colonies until the temperance awakening days. To show how universally liquor was served to all who had to do with a funeral, let me give you the bill for the mortuary expenses of David Porter of Hartford, Connecticut, who was drowned in 1678. Even town paupers had two or three gallons of rum or a barrel of cider given by the town to serve as speeding libations at their unmourned funerals. The liquor at the funeral of a minister was usually paid for by the church or town. Those are often interchangeable terms for the same body. So folks, when I go, don't let me down. You know, Ed, before we leave Benjamin Albee's gristmill on the Mill River, I'll have to admit that I'm still confused about something. It's easy to see how the Mill River supported his mill with a substantial water power source to turn the grinding stone, but what kind of water wheel was used at his mill? Could you explain that to me, please? Well, John, you know in that era there were four basic kinds of wheels to choose from the undershot and the overshot wheel, and the pitch back and the breast shot wheel. And each one had pros and cons with regard to the efficiency and eventual selection. First, let's assume that the dam was higher by a couple of feet or more back then. That would create a generous source of water in the upstream basin, as we've already discussed. Let's also assume that the mill race is wide enough at four to six feet to capture a goodly flow of moving water. Based on the height of the meadow behind the mill to the east on the Plain Street side and the gradual grade in height to the west on the Anthony Circle side, Alby may have been able to raise the dam to a workable height to use the overshot wheel a more efficient style of wheel. Some of the older maps of the Menden South Milford area show a pretty large pond of water in that part of the river. In fact, the current beaver population in the area appear to be trying to recreate that pond again. Alternatively, based on where the mill was situated on this fairly high terrain, I'm not sure if a higher efficiency pitchback or overshot wheel would work because the water source would need to be much higher than it is now. Possibly, that'll be constructed either a breast shot or a lower efficiency undershot wheel. The undershot wheel would require a consistent and substantial water flow that I think would be available during the high use period after harvest in the early winter or in the spring after the corn was dried out for processing. Ed, then it looks like Alby could possibly have constructed either style, right Ed? Is that your final answer? Yes, John, final answer. Episode 2, A Town No More, sheds light on the foundation of Menden documenting her hard work establishing families, farms, and community. Also, her early untimely and gruesome demise under the torch. Yet Menden's formation was humbly a birth, not so much unlike many others in the New World, a startup, if you will, requiring a redoubling of effort to reestablish her roots. Surely, the recollection of their old world in England was still fresh in their memory in 1660's Massachusetts Bay Colony. Perhaps many fond ones from Menden's namesake, the town of Mendham, Suffolk, England. Menden would eventually become a mother town, and who of us can ever forget our mother? No one, of course. 
Wouldn't it be special to learn more about what may have been etched into the minds of Netmark Plantation's founders and their ancestry, arriving from faraway shores? Let's do that. Allow me to introduce author, historian, Colin Herbert of Mendham, Suffolk, England. Hello to everyone, especially our friends in Mendham, Massachusetts in the United States. My name is Colin Herbert and I live in the village of Mendham in the county of Suffolk in England, part of the United Kingdom. I know residents of Mendham have been researching the history of your town for quite a few years and for the last two or three years we've been doing the same for Mendham Village. And I wanted to take a few minutes to describe some of the things that the founders of Mendham may have been familiar with in our village as Puritans had migrated from the counties of Suffolk and Norfolk and elsewhere to the towns of Weymouth and Braintree uh, in Massachusetts Bay Colony, eventually to Mendon so many years ago. Let's have a look. Two years ago I published a book called A History of Mendon Parish. Today the parish consists of two villages, Mendham itself and the village of Withersdale and has a combined population of around 400 people. Although I wrote the book, it was a community effort and everyone contributed old photographs and information and supported the printing costs. Sadly, the book is out of print until we can get a large enough order for a reprint. Mendham is famous as the birthplace of the artist Sir Alfred Munnings. He was a painter of landscapes and horses and a chairman of the Royal Academy of Arts here in England. The book takes the form of a stroll around the parish, accompanied by Sir Alfred, researching some of his local paintings and many of the characters in those paintings. I include also quotations from Alfred's autobiography to bring old Mendham to life. He died in 1954, but is seen here standing in front of Mendham Mill, where he was born in 1878. There has been a mill on this site since the 11th century, and so some of your town's founders would be familiar with it, although the actual building will have been developed since those times. This is the mill from the air, and it sits about half a mile outside the centre of Mendham village. Who knows, Benjamin Albee may have learned his miller's trade from working mills similar to Mendham's. We have some marvellous images of the workings of the mill, some of the machinery, including the wheel sluice control, is still in place today. In this wider aerial view of Mendham, a few years ago when the flooding was quite bad, we can see that Mendham sits on the River Waveney, and the road into Mendham from the left crosses a floodplain which accommodates excess water during the winter before crossing the bridge to the northwest of All Saints Church, which is in the centre of the picture. The mill is out of the picture to the top right, but the Waveney can be seen curving to the right towards it. However, in the time of your founders, the road and bridge were aligned directly with the church. In that time, wooden bridges were the norm, and these are the earliest engravings of one such bridge in the early 19th century, and you can see the alert alignment with the church tower. Here is the view directly over that bridge, the founders probably crossed an earlier wooden bridge, but almost definitely in the same place, and this is the view that they would have seen several hundred years ago. Here is the new alignment of the bridge taken from the tower of All Saints Church. The trees on the far side of the river are willows, and every few years they are harvested for their wood, which of course is made into cricket bats. Mendham is over on the right hand side. As in many English villages, there has been a church on the present site for over a thousand years, probably a lot longer. All Saints today benefits from a major Victorian restoration. In Withersdale, there is an even older church building. St Mary Magdalene, we can date back to the 11th century, so some founders may have actually worshipped here, perhaps sitting in some of these very old wooden pews. Some founders will have seen other buildings around Mendham that are not here today. 
This one I called Corner Cottage, which sat right in the middle of Mendham on the corner of what is today a small village green, but no trace of it remains above ground. The white cottage in the background is High Hall Cottage, the oldest cottage remaining in Mendham. It's timber framed and remains thatched, as they all would have been in past times. And if we look at a corresponding picture of about a hundred years ago, very little with that cottage has changed. To the left is what I have called the disappearing cottage, because we've been able to track in photographs its demise over the years, gradually being reduced in size and latterly part of it being used as a small garden shed. In this wonderful photograph is a disappearing cottage on the left, with High Hall Cottage on the right. Finally, in 1985, the last remaining part of Disappearing Cottage was taken down, but we can still see traces of the structure today under the patio of High Hall Cottage and the old cottage next door. Seeing those timbers there reminds me that in some of the older properties in the parish, we can still see marks that we call Marion marks carved into the old oak beams. Your founders would have see, seen these, and possibly even carved some of them themselves. They often look like a, a letter W, and are typically found around openings and voids where mysterious eddies of air might be mistaken for the manifestations of spirits, often the beams, the Bressemer beams, above fireplaces. They are thought to call on the protection of the Virgin Mary, and stand for the title Virgin of Virgins. A variation is a combined V and M, standing for Virgin Mary. Why is the symbol apparently upside down? Well, that's easy. Spirits were thought to come down the chimney head first, and so could read them on their way down. Looking in the other direction, in what we today call the street, we have a view that would be partially familiar to your founders. The blacksmith is on the left, under the chestnut tree, and we will see this later. The cottages on the right are called Waveney Cottages. There's a plaque on the gable end that we can just read, and were built in about 1840. Before that, there would have been timber-framed and thatched cottages there. In the distance on the left is the corner cottage. The shop on the left only closed in the year 2000, after being started in the mid-19th century. Just visible is a gable roof poking out from the far end of Waveney Cottages, is the old coal house, and we'll see this in a moment. Today the Waveney cottages have gone, making way for a car park and the development of housing over the road on the left. The chestnut tree remains. This is probably my favourite old photograph of Mendham. It is of the blacksmith, and you can see the young chestnut tree sapling on the left and it's leaning at its base towards the east, as the current one is today. Over the road, the coal house remains, once having been used to store items for the parish as well as coal for the poor. Latterly, we can see on census records that a man named James Norman lived there, and this was confirmed by Alfred's autobiography. Old Norman, as he was called, was Alfred's great friend and mentor, and he originated from our neighbouring village of Metfield, originally Medfield. Old Norman had lots of children and grandchildren, and we have established contact with living relatives who knew nothing about his life. In 1851, he worked in London with a great exhibition and walked home from there some 100 miles. He died at the age of 93 after falling off a ladder whilst picking apples. They were tough in those days. On a side note, it's fascinating how the towns of Mendon and Medfield and Mendham and Metfield are in such close proximity and are historically intertwined. Here we see old Norman in the blue jacket in one of Alfred's paintings called The Gala Day. And the original painting, which is worth a lot of money now, is in a museum in the town of Preston in the north of England. The curators there knew nothing about the characters in the painting, but we managed to identify them all, including the children on the left. 
Talking of old characters, this is a remarkable picture of Nobby and Charlotte Grey. Nobby acted as a model for Alfred in many of his early pictures. He was a Suffolk man, but Charlotte was a true gypsy from a long line of travelling families. They took their caravan with their son around Suffolk and beyond to fairs during the summer, but in the winter returned to the pastures of Mendham village. Some bungalows in Mendham today are called the Greys. Charlotte Grey is famous for being in one of Alfred's paintings called Charlotte's Pony, and this forms the subject of the village sign that we use in Mendham today. The sign stands just feet from the site of the old corner cottage. One building that your founders would have seen is Mendham Priory, which was founded in the 12th century and sat on a slight rise or an island in the marsh between Mendham and Withersdale. We have these engravings of the building in various states of decay and sadly today only the smallest pile of rubble remains. However, stonework from the Priory can be seen in many of the houses and gardens in Mendham and Withersdale, having been scavenged by the locals over the years, possibly even by your founders. Recent magnetometer studies have discovered a lost 13th century settlement between Mendham and Withersdale, probably serving the Priory, which was over to the left in this image. If you look at the magnetometer results, you can see the old curves of the marsh edge. Here is Mendham today, with all its trees, seen from a computer-controlled drone. The bridge is far left, then All Saints Church, the street in the centre, and new housing in the right foreground. The mill is just visible in the trees, as a white structure in the middle distance towards the right. The essence of Mendham is not unlike your beautiful rural hilltop village. This is Withersdale from the air. Mendham is about a mile away to the top right. There is a playing field here. And next to that, there is the thriving Mendham and Withersdale Village Hall. And behind that, the multi-use games area, both of which we only built in the last five years. What about the name Mendham? This is an extract from a dictionary of Suffolk place names by the mathematician Keith Briggs. We can see that the name derives in some way from Minds or Minders Homestead, or today we would say farm. Today we have Mundy's Lane leading out of Mendham with Mundy's Farm on it, which may be related, but we have to do a lot more research. Finally, I want to tell you about the Honeypot Circle. Just a few years ago, I discovered in old aerial imagery an oval shape in the landscape between Mendham and Metfield. It's delineated today by hedgerows and ditches and is clearly man-made, being too neat to be a natural feature. The oval is tilted slightly to the left and it's about one mile high and 0.6 miles across. At the bottom right of the shape is Metfield Village. St Mary Magdalene Church is on the left of the shape with Withersdale further over to the left. Mendham is off towards the top left. I actually live in the top left of the, the shape. Only a small section of the shape appears on present day maps as Honeypot Lane, hence my calling it the Honeypot Circle. The fascinating thing is that St Mary Magdalene Church, as well as the two churches in Metfield, and all of the farmhouses in the vicinity sit exactly on the circle. There is an old farmhouse in the centre, but nothing of note, and no record of anything more significant there. Who built it, when, how, and what its purpose was, I and the Suffolk County archaeologists have absolutely no idea. We think it dates to prehistory, but because of the alignment of buildings, we can deduce that until fairly recently, people knew of its existence and for some reason respected it, revered it, and felt that buildings needed to be associated and aligned with it. That applies to the churches built more than a thousand years ago, as well as the Methodist chapel in Metfield, built only in the early 20th century. So, we finish with a mystery, 
and I wonder if the founders of Menden knew about the Honeypot Circle. I suspect they did, and I bet we all wish we could talk to them today to see what they knew. Well, I will say goodbye from Mendham and hope that in some small way I've painted an intriguing picture of what the Mendham founders or their ancestors may have seen, things that we can only glimpse today. Mendham and Mendham are kindred spirits. May we both relish the future as we cherish our past. Thank you. Bye-bye. During the early 1670s, Menden was focused on growing her families, farms, and community. She was a real town now, ever since May of 67, and life was getting to be quote, unquote, normal. Lots to do, yes, with the endless days and nights of constant work, save the Sabbath, but life was good. And she was getting along with her neighbors, wasn't she? as we learn from the Fernando Thea story and the work of Elliot Gukin and others who were Christianizing the natives into praying Indian towns. That was all working out well, wasn't it? Not. The soon to be conflagration in Menden, as well as numerous other frontier towns during the King Philip War was brought about by a conflict of cultures by 1675, the peaceful coexistence that was demonstrated at the first Thanksgiving in Plymouth had long ended. Lack of agreement with regard to land, religion, and way of life led to such intense conflict that the Native Americans thought it was necessary to banish the English settlers from southern and central New England and send them back to Europe. The first attack was in Swansea, Massasoit's home near Mount Hope, in June of 75, by Poconocket Wampanoags. King Philip was their sachem now, since Massasoit had passed in the early 1660s, as well as his firstborn son Wamsutta, aka Alexander, soon thereafter, in 1662, by dubious circumstances. By 1675, a strategic coexistence between the English settlers and the Native American population of New England was strained to the breaking point. The settlers' unquenchable hunger for Indian land and the unyielding attitude of the Massachusetts and Plymouth Bay colonies had angered the great Wampanoag chief Medicom, named King Philip by the English. The hostilities that ensued over the next 18 months came to be known as King Philip's War. Philip was probably reaching his wit's end. Can you imagine the concerns he had for the well-being of his people and that of other Native American tribes in New England? Three weeks after the Swansea incident, the attack on Menden on July 14, 1675, sent shockwaves and terror throughout Massachusetts Bay Colony. The attack was by Nipmuc natives and it meant that King Philip's attempts at lobbying neighboring tribes to war had succeeded. You'll remember that King Philip and his Poconocket bands had outwitted the Puritan militia who were about to destroy him soon after the start of the war. As the militia marched into the Poconocket Peninsula on June 30th towards Mount Hope, Philip's homeland, they curiously decided to fortify and remain at their garrison house before attacking the next morning. Philip and his community smartly scurried across Mount Hope Bay and into Weedamoo's Pocasset Swamps during the night, thus eluding the disappointed militia the following morning. For several weeks, Philip and his people battled the militia, and by the end of July 75, the natives slipped back over the Taunton River, heading into central Massachusetts Bay Colony and their supporting Nipmuc allies. You might be asking yourself, why did the Nipmuc Sachem Matunas 
and his followers attack Menden on July 14, 1675. How did the Nipmucks know that the war had started? Did Philip Snapchat, email, or tweet Matunas about his dilemmas and his strategy? After all, the distance between Menden and Swansea of 65 to 70 miles was no short trip through forests and swamp on few scattered trails. Communication of events may have been slower back then, but nevertheless, Philip's overall plans and goals had already been passed to all the central and southern New England natives during the prior months and even years. Certainly, by July, the Nipmucks would have known about the actual start of the King Philip War a month earlier that June in Swansea. But wait! The Nipmucks were Christianized, weren't they? Remember the praying Indian villages of Hassanameset, Wasantug, Natick, etc.? And remember that Menden's Indian deed had explicitly stated that the natives were allowed to still use the land that they had sold to the founders for hunting and fishing, a clause that was purposely written into the deed to circumvent a problem that had plagued land purchases earlier in Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay colonies. Specifically, that even though native land was transferred between tribes and clans, native culture was that land was held to be owned by all. This philosophy was certainly not the way of the English. Also, the Nipmucks were good neighbors, weren't they? Sometimes living and working together. Remember the Ferdinando Thea story earlier? The log-throwing Olympic event? Yes, in general, they were coexisting neighbors, but the pot of disenchantment had been stirring by Philip for many months and years, and it was reaching a boiling point for sure. And yet there was more, so much more. Let's dig deeper. Have you heard of the story of Zachary Smith and his murder? No? Well, listen to this. You'll be amazed. Zachary was a young man that was traveling through Dedham Woods. Remember how towns were being developed from east to west, leading away from the seacoast? Well, young Zachary stopped for the night at the home of Caleb Church and left early the following morning. A short time after leaving Church's home, three young Nipmuc natives were spotted traveling on that same road and in that very same direction. Church noted this because they were behaving insolently, throwing stones at church and using foul language. These three natives overtook Smith and seemingly killed him for some small effects that he had. His body was found near the sawmill in Dedham soon thereafter. They found the three natives and took them into custody. At the trial, but one of them was found guilty. He was executed on the Boston Commons gallows where his head was removed and set upon a stake where it remained at least five years. Who was this young Nipmuc native? Well, he was no other than the son of Matunas, the Nipmuc sachem that led the massacre on Menden in July. Do you think that that hanging of Matunas' son for the murder of Zachary Smith left a bitter taste? Maybe, maybe not. Menden historian, the Reverend Carlton Staples, wondered what it meant for the families in Menden, exposed to more attack and far from a media assistance not very capable of defense. In his words, it was a time of awful darkness. A pall of anxiety and fear hung over the town in the expectation of a renewal of attack. An express was sent to Medfield, giving the alarm. And Reverend Emerson went to Boston to ask for military protection. It was readily granted, 
and Captain Henchman was dispatched with the military company to secure and save the place. And as well, the court had issued a decree forbidding the inhabitants of Menden to leave the settlement on pain of forfeiting all their rights in their lands that they had subdued from the wilderness. But many of Menden's founders soon gave up their homes and went to the safety of other towns. The remainder of the people finally gathered in two of the largest houses. A considerable force was kept here to maintain this frontier town. The deprivation and suffering became so severe that people could not endure it and they gradually stole away. The troops were withdrawn six months after the first attack. The place was abandoned. In the words of Cotton Mather, Quote, another candle of the Lord extinguished. Early the following year, 1676, the native Nipmucks burned the remaining buildings and for the tolls and sacrifices of 12 years, little was left but charred logs and ashes. The memorial stone made of rough onion slate fittingly symbolizes the massive enduring character of the men and women who subdued the wilderness, conquered the savage, and laid the foundation of the town in love of liberty and the service of God. The inscription reads, Near this spot, the wife and son of Matthias Puffer, the son of John Rockwood, and other inhabitants of Menden were killed. But wait, there's more, so much more. Would Menden recover from her horror, rise from the ashes and rebuild? Or would her founders be pushed into the sea and back to England as the natives desired? How would the Mohawks in faraway upstate New York help decide their fate? What would become of the New England Native Americans what would become of our founders? Episode 3, Out of Ashes, 1676 to 1763, explores the rebuilding process, the neighborhood feuds, the civic and religious awakening, and the early yet eventual rumblings of Menden's Radicals. Each day I live, I want to be a day to give the best of me. I'm only one, but not alone. My finest day is yet unknown. I broke my
folle 